Thanks for tuning in to our next Mondi e-commerce webinar. We are here to learn from experts in the e-commerce market, packaging and logistics. So let's get started. Our guest today is Sofia Zavialova. Sofia joined Statista in 2020 and as a senior analyst, she has been working on projects related to e-commerce, social commerce, re-commerce, digital payments, neobanking and digital health among others. She is an expert in market modeling, quantitative forecasting, and data reporting to corporate clients. Sofia holds a master's degree from the Turku School of Economics with a focus on strategic foresight and international business. Welcome, Sofia, and thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you, Nedim, and it's a pleasure for us and for Statista to be invited to this webinar. To kick us off, can you tell us a bit about Statista's areas of expertise? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so our main um, challenge starts with uh, collecting the data. Um, yeah, as you know, we are publishing data for various markets and e-commerce is our biggest and most popular and most frequently requested market. And uh, our modeling approach for e-commerce mainly consists of a broad uh, uh, set of uh, diff different data sources. First of all, we need to collect data for the user. Uh, user uh, behavior and uh, we are collecting it through our global consumer survey that's being collected several times a year and it uh, can be ac uh, accessed via our consumer insights tool and uh, it covers more than 55 uh, different countries uh, and um, uh, gives us a good understanding of how uh, users are shopping uh, across various product categories from fashion to furniture to electronics, food and beverages and uh, with a very granular split. Uh, when we do model, uh, after we model user data, we uh, need to model the market size for the total retail, so for various consumer markets. We have a dedicated team of experts who are uh, modeling those uh, markets, and then uh, we take their data and uh, need to estimate what would be the online shares out of the total retail market. And we do the, uh, this, we build that estimations using a very uh, comprehensive approach using Google Trends. Uh, and uh, thanks to that, we have an understanding of what kind of uh, share, uh, what's the sh share of the online sales out of the total retail uh, sales for this or another product. And uh, after that, we finally can model the uh, online uh, revenues uh, market for different product categories. And uh, uh, of course, here we have to keep in mind uh, that we cover more than 150 countries in our um, market insights tool. And uh, there are some countries with quite low data availability and for these countries we have to use a driver-based approach when we uh, have data for various macro uh, macroeconomic indicators such as uh, GDP per capita, smartphone penetration, uh, internet penetration, consumer spending per, per various products per capita. We use these factors and we can estimate uh, data for countries with low data availability. After that uh, we can finally build forecast using various statistical techniques and uh, of course, the last important step is to do uh, data assurance and quality check uh, that we usually do via a top-down approach when we estimate market size uh, based on shop data, online shops available data. And of course, we conduct various uh, expert interviews and interviews with uh, key players that provide uh, feedback on uh, our data. This sounds like a like a very robust process. Um, so thank you for sharing. We at Mondi, the, the group e-commerce team, has been using Statista for for some years now, and we are we are happy with the with the quality of data. We're also happy with uh, with our collaboration. And the the second question: How can e-commerce businesses use your data? Um, or the data analytics to gain insights into customer behavior and make data-driven decisions to improve their operations? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And uh, in fact, we study a lot how our clients, which are also very often e-commerce businesses, how they are using our data. 
Uh, and here we mainly see two major um, areas of use cases. It's either when they need to do market research to study market potential across various geographies, or when they need to uh, build a proper strategic uh, um, strategy for the future of their businesses. For example, when a company wants to expand into another market, so international expansion, this is where our data is very handy because we cover uh, more than 150 countries, as I mentioned, and uh, we also provide forecasts for the next five years. And with our data, our clients can study what is the market potential in the other regions all over the world. Of course, they also can use our data when they want to expand their product portfolio. For example, if it's a beverage company and they would like to start maybe selling, uh, producing and selling the uh, snacks and something related to the food industry, they can also uh, see the market potential in the other uh, product categories and uh, use our data for that. Of course, they can also build more informed pricing strategy, uh, differentiate uh, for the online or offline sales strategies and uh, study better the uh, landscape and key player analysis because we also provide the uh, most popular uh, company, uh, the biggest company data on various market segments and uh, country level. Uh, so but basically this would be the main uh, areas, but of course we also provide other services of course, our clients can also stay up to date with the trends because we provide various reports and um, uh, insights compasses where we cover and analyze uh, interesting emerging trends that have impact on e-commerce market. Sophia. And turning now to the current e-commerce market, how do you see it developing and what growth do you expect over the next few years? And also what opportunities and challenges might arise? Um, uh, so uh, at the moment, uh, we, according to our data, the current market size for 2023 on the global level is estimated uh, of um, uh, more than three trillion, three trillion uh, six hundred billion US dollars on the global level, and uh, we expect the market to grow uh, by uh, this year by around 15 percent on the global level. Of course, it uh, the growth rate depends uh, on the region, and uh, we also have to understand the different product categories behave differently for example um, in the due to recession and inflationary pressures fashion and uh, electronics product categories are performing slightly worse uh, than well actually quite wor uh, much worse than in the, in the past uh, but uh, we still uh, expect that the market uh, would keep growing by around 11 percent 11 percent of uh, compound annual growth rate by 2027 um, for this year if we look at the key players performance uh, most of them are uh, keep keep uh, generating higher net sales and revenues uh, amazon just uh, released their uh, financial results and it had a net sales increase of 11 percent but again it depends on the industry uh, the land about use of fashion e-commerce players are not doing that well instead in beverages and food segment is getting uh, better so it really depends on the key player uh, on the on the market segment and on the country. But in general, we do believe uh, that uh, the market uh, online shares out of total retail would keep growing. And uh, this year, for example, it's estimated of around 13 percent on the world that le worldwide level. But uh, by 2027, the market share online share would reach around 20 uh, percent for some product categories would even cross 30 five percent out of total retail so we are pretty confident that the market is growing because the habit of online shopping is already there in the population and um, when when we look further into the future mm -hmm. um, when will the market be stable again and when do we expect stable growth um, that's an interesting question 
Uh, we personally expect the stable growth uh, already uh, set in with this year, but we have to consider great geopolitical uncertainty, especially in Europe. Uh, of course, if no other shock events, uh, such as pandemics or another war would happen, the, uh, the growth should stabilize. Because, as I mentioned, um, online shopping is already in our population uh, across different regions, and it is not competing with the offline shop, with the physical shopping. So there is uh, no uh, actual reason for it to slow down. Uh, but of course, we have to consider here how the societies, the economies would be able to cope with inflationary pressures that are keep rising. Uh, well, now it's getting a bit better in the middle of this year. We can see that also consumer confidence uh, is returning. Uh, but still, uh, especially after pandemics, most of the users prefer to spend actually more money on experiences than physical goods. So that's another factor to consider. But in general, we if no other shock events would happen, we expect the stable growth rate uh, to start already this uh, next year. And now, because you mentioned uh, the, the pandemic, uh, I would like to uh, pick up the, the question related to this. We have seen the market drop within the last uh, and current year in comparison to the COVID-19 period. Has this been anticipated and expected? And what are the main reasons behind the drop? Uh, yes, sure. Just a bit of background information, as you also mentioned, uh, in 2020, as a result of huge COVID boost, uh, when all the shops were closed in most of the countries, uh, e-commerce experienced a huge uh, surge of 30% on the worldwide level. Uh, but that was an exceptional situation. And uh, of course, uh, in 2021, um, COVID uh, related uh, lockdowns started loosening and most of the uh, shops started opening. So users could go, consumers could go back to physical stores. And of course, we expected that the growth rate of the e commerce would start slowly slowing down. In fact, in 2021, it was already 24% compared to 30% in the previous year. But of course, uh, we didn't expect that it would go down down almost negative in 2022. And of course, the main reason to that is the war between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, especially in Europe, the growth rate went down by 12%. In some countries like US, China performed re uh, relatively better of uh, having the growth rate of 4 and 8% respectively. Um, but uh, of course, uh, for Europe, it was a, a huge hit, um, mainly due to uh, economic, uh, yeah, well, geopolitical instability, but also supply chain disruptions. So many uh, products, uh, millions of products were stuck on uh, on the borders, and uh, the users could not get their uh, parcels delivered on time, which of course also affected the inclination of ordering more online, and of course uh, instability uh, of the economic market. So the inflation, which uh, uh, grew by quite a lot, uh, unemployment. So many companies started laying offs, also in the e-commerce sector we uh, could name quite some of them. And uh, in general, consumer confidence decreased uh, a lot and uh, we could see how many uh, consumers started saving more and spending less on discretionary products especially. So if we take the, the, the two years during the COVID pandemic as outliers, then we, we still see a, a solid growth in the, in the e-commerce industry. Uh, well, the econ economy has to recover first. Uh, right now, um, inflation is slowly slowing down. Also, consumer confidence is going back to the normal, but it's still lower than the pre-war uh, levels. So uh, we do expect the growth, of course, to continue. Uh, but uh, it still it will depend on how quickly can governments and companies adapt to this new environment. Sophia, how does the projected e-commerce market by 2027 compare to the current market size and what regions are expected to contribute significantly to this growth? Um, yes, so we expect that the market would grow at the compound average growth of 
um, uh, 11% by 2027 on the global level. And of course, the leading countries here are China, even though in China we can also see that the growth rates slow, are starting to slow down. Uh, gradually, because the market already reached uh, its highest penetration rate. As we know, China is a highly digital savvy society, and uh, it's always on the uh, upfront in terms of e-commerce and social commerce and online shopping and social media use. So uh, the market is already uh, quite mature, and now for Chinese uh, players, uh, and now one other strategy to keep growing would be to expand to European market, for example. And we know some good examples of Shane and Temu, the popular marketplaces that are becoming more popular in Europe as well. So uh, that was about China and in general, APAC regions, uh, of course, contributing a lot uh, is generating the highest revenue in terms of market size. And then, of course, it's uh, followed by China is followed by the US uh, and uh, Europe is uh, taking the third place. When it comes to Chinese companies entering European market, uh, we we did see Shane entering the market. Uh, Alibaba is already present. Can we see uh, or can we expect uh, other large companies such as JD.com uh, following and doing the same in the future? I would expect uh, that they can, uh, but first of all, they need to also test, uh, if, uh, Shane and Temu need to test uh, the market uh, in Europe also because the European consumers are still have to, uh, struggling with the uh, inflation and the uh, uh, increase in prices also for the energy consumption. So I, I assume that they might enter the market, yes, uh, but maybe not this year because uh, this year is still quite struggling. It could be a long-term strategy. Yes, yes. Okay. Why not? Very good. But they, by the way, sorry, just to interrupt. Uh, of course, uh, there are no other uh, um, promising regions in Europe, not just Western Europe, but of course South Eastern Europe, uh, where Chinese companies could also expand. But maybe here there could be some cultural challenges and resistance, uh, like to as a and lack of trust, maybe even from the local consumers. Uh, the next question related to the e-commerce market uh, growth potentials. Are there any emerging e-commerce markets showing significant growth potential? And what unique challenges and do businesses face when expanding into these regions? Uh, yeah, if we look from the worldwide perspective, uh, we can observe quite uh, strong growth rates uh, in Latin America, especially Brazil, Mexico, and uh, Mercado Libre is a great example of a very successful e-commerce marketplace in that area. Um, then, of course, Southeast Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia are also generated quite uh, high uh, growth rates, plus they have a very high uh, population size, of which is almost equal to the European one, it's around 600 million. That's also uh, quite an important factor for the further uh, stronger market growth. Uh, but when we zoom into Europe, within Europe, uh, as I previously mentioned, uh, uh, we can see stronger growth potential in the southern uh, and eastern European countries, especially in Balkan countries like Bulgaria, uh, Serbia, uh, Romania. Uh, what would be the most uh, uh, typical challenges uh, for the e-commerce players in these areas? Uh, first of all, these are logistical challenges. Uh, not just in Europe, but also in Latin America. Uh, it, it is really crucial for e-commerce businesses to establish properly working distribution and networking system. Without that, uh, parcels cannot be delivered to their end consumers, and that's uh, always a challenge. Uh, for example, in uh, some Latin American countries, uh, there are no properly working delivery companies, and the Mercado Libre had to establish its own uh, networking system from scratch because it couldn't rely neither on local delivery providers, but also uh, couldn't rely on the official uh, post offices because they simply are not reliable and uh, the delivery time takes uh, quite, quite a lot which is unacceptable for e-commerce uh, business because consumers want to have their parcels delivered fast. 
So logistical challenge would be number one uh, uh, problem. Another issue, a challenge would be related to infrastructural uh, development, internet penetration, the speed of internet. Uh, if we uh, see the ranking in terms of uh, internet penetration and speed, uh, usually South European countries are uh, scoring quite low, especially in Bulgaria. It's uh, among the lowest scores and uh, it's actually uh, correlated also with the penetration of uh, online banking in these countries, which are essential for the uh, e-commerce growth, because if you want to pay for goods online, you have to have an uh, online bank. And uh, we can see that uh, online penet banking penetration in Bulgaria is uh, quite low. It's around 20% compared to Nordic countries where it's around 90%. So that's also a challenge. Uh, so proper infrastructure, but also educating users, Consumers to uh, to be to, to have less resistance and to start using online banking. That's already a cultural resistance. Um, yeah, these were the main challenges I would say. Moving now to the trends and uh, looking at the consumer behavior in e-commerce, do we see any trends that mainly support the future growth? Um, yes, uh, well, we, we see a lot of trends, uh, some of them are um, uh, boosted by technological advancement, by AI, but uh, in um, our research, the most important ones uh, that contribute to the high growth are, of course, the rise of social commerce and live commerce, so live stream events, live streaming events, and uh, uh, of course, also sustainability which has an ambiguous impact because it's on the one hand driving the growth, but it's also uh, slowing down the growth due to many reasons. And also metaverse, uh, everyone is talking about that metaverse now. Uh, we are also really curious to see how it would affect e-commerce. Um, the projections uh, for the fundings are quite high, but uh, for now it still seems to be quite futuristic term. Um, let's let's pick up on the sustainability. Uh, what role does sustainability play, and how it is connected uh, to the e-commerce market? So here we can see two directions. On the one hand, sustainability um, changes consumer behavior because, of course, consumers become more environmentally conscious. So they do not, they want to reduce their environmental footprint. They want to consume less and re reduce their consumption and buy and order less. So from that point of view, the um, the growth rate could potentially go down. Um, but it also depends on how businesses can uh, react on that. For example, now we can see that Amazon gives a, a possibility to their users to collect several products in uh, one parcel. The waiting time of the delivery would be uh, longer, but they still have this possibility uh, and the product, all the products would be delivered in one box, but from different sellers. So uh, it depends on how key players are reacting to that. Uh, the other uh, effect of the sustainability is, on the other hand, uh, giving rise to uh, different uh, uh, business model of e-commerce. And here we see the rise of online resale or e-commerce market, uh, which is uh, growing at a very high speed. Uh, we believe that it will grow by 29% by 2027 uh, worldwide. Uh, uh, if we see the most popular apps today, Vinted is one of the good examples. They are always ranking uh, the highest. Also, the average online shopping session on Vinted compared to other e-commerce uh, um, platforms is quite high. I think it's uh, around uh, 14 minutes compared to eight minutes on average. So it, it is quite uh, uh, it's quite an indicator that uh, users are interested in that, and there is this uh, uh, new rise um, of the e-commerce and online resale market. And uh, it, it is great that e-commerce actually can provide infrastructure for for that. Absolutely, and also other big players such as Zalando now also yes. have the e-commerce part and e-commerce uh, strategy um, on, on their own, and I'm sure that other big companies will also follow and uh, follow this trend. True. 
Yeah, uh, that's a very good uh, point. Also, H and M uh, and uh, Patagonia. They are also they also already some years ago they launched this uh, pre-owned or pre-loved features on their websites. They're experimenting quite a lot with that. And the greatest thing is that there is demand from the consumer side. Sofia, uh, the the metaverse. This is uh, one of the um, the highly publicized topics, and uh, the metaverse is expected to become a powerful tool for certain brands. Could you provide some insights into how companies can use the metaverse and what to expect from it in the future? Uh, yes, that's a good question as well. Um... Yeah, we can see that uh, it is growing quite a lot and uh, half of the fundings of the metaverse would actually are projected to uh, to be dedicated to e-commerce. Um, we can see a lot of brands that start using uh, services like virtual try-on services or digital collectibles, especially luxury brands are taking up this trend, especially in China. For example, uh, on the Timo luxury pavilion, they ex uh, released several, I think more than 30 collections and they were sold uh, and the millions of consumers bought it. But honestly saying there is still quite a gap between um, metaverse and e-commerce. According to many servers, uh, we can see that uh, not many uh, consumers find it that important and uh, there is this uh, misunderstanding. I think metaverse, metaverse has to have more physical component for it to become more popular at the moment as i said it is still too far in the future so we are looking uh, when it comes to the tipping point uh, 20 27 28 2030 um yes uh, around that maybe higher even Could you elaborate a bit more on the social e-commerce trend and how they influence the overall e-commerce market? Yes, of course. So social commerce is driving growth for e-commerce. Social commerce, but by that I mean um, the um, online shopping via social media platforms where a user is not redirected to another vendor's web website. So the transaction is actually conducted on the social media platform. Uh, it is a really rising trend now in Europe. Uh, it's actually quite low the penetration rate, but uh, in Asian countries it's been popular already for quite some time. Initially, it, uh, the first uh, platform that uh, tested social commerce uh, in 2016, so before COVID, uh, was also in China and they started with live, com live commerce. Um, for some reason, Chinese uh, consumers tend to be much more eager to online shopping, whereas in Europe, probably the, the reason to such a slow penetration is uh, lack of trust and maybe also da data privacy issues. I think that uh, European users, they do not want to be um, uh, their data to be shared and uh, used uh, for um, new products creation purposes, so just as an example. Example. Yeah, uh, but uh, social commerce is rising as a result of, of course, influence, influence of shopping. Uh, we can see celebrities and uh, just opinion leaders serving uh, um, this trend. Um, uh, most of the product categories that are sold by social commerce are, of course, fashion and beauty products, uh, makeup and uh, so on. Uh, but uh, there is another interesting trend uh, in China. Um, I think last year, the most pro popular product category sold on social commerce was actually food, because in the times of lockdown, uh, it uh, was quite uh, useful for uh, consumers to order food via social commerce and not just food. Uh, yeah, uh, they uh, wanted to innovate villages and help uh, farmers in China to sell uh, products via live streaming events. Uh, it looked uh, really spectacular. Maybe German peasants and the farmers could also <laughs> benefit from this trend in the future. But yeah, I find it super interesting and also changing the culture, but also helping other industries to grow. So e-commerce and social commerce is changing the world. Yeah, exactly. It's all about consumption. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Sofia, thank you very much for the conversation and uh, for unwrapping industry insights with us today. It was a, a pleasure and um, I, I enjoyed the conversation. I'm sure that our viewers will do the same. Thank you, Nadim. And it was again a great pleasure for Statistic for me to uh, talk to you today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.